you gotta love these 80s songs. Hi guys. So I'm driving one way right now. I'm in Chicago. I was uh, here for specific reasons and we got a call from an old customer slash, friends of, fr slash friend of ours. Can't talk. I need my Dunkin Donuts right now. My coffee. Um, and she has a bird to relinquish to us. She rescued, let me turn on this music here, right? You're going to be listening to me and 80s music at the same time, multitasking. Um, she had gotten a few parrots uh, several years ago from uh, a rescue situation. Uh, hers was a legit rescue. I know that's a big topic right now out there, you know, what we consider rescue, what not. Um, she said that she had gotten a few parrots from someone who had 40 plus parrots and uh, the parrots were malnutritioned, not, not in the right cage, etc., the right housing. Well, she had relinquished one to us um, a few years ago. It was a cockatoo. The cockatoo pokey is doing great. And um, then she called about a week ago and said that she had another one. The other one is a blue and gold macaw. He, it's a boy, he is about 14, 15 years old. And she said that she tried to keep him. Um, and he's just not doing good right now. He seems a little stressed. He turned out to be, from what she says, an all man bird. Now. You know, being a parent trainer myself and a bird trainer, I always hesitate with saying an all-man or an all-woman bird because sometimes it really is just a situation. Um, but she says that he is an all-man bird because he loves her son, who is now going to college. Her son can go and pick him up and twirl him around and bathe him, but she cannot. I'm sorry, I'm looking at the time. I'm making sure I have enough uh, recording time. But... Um, she said that now her son is going to college. He gets on his um, playtop cage, never wants to come down, and she had to take him to her shop because he's a honker. And as you know, macaws can honk. Oh, they can honk like super bad, <laughs> but that's what macaws do. And um, she tries to keep him at her shop uh, so that you know he can greet people and stuff but I guess recently I think he bit her son or he bit her and now the shop is afraid for liability reasons so I'm a little excited to meet this little guy or big guy from what I hear I think he's a little chunky and a little um, round <laughs> but um, again so he I think he's between 14 and 16 years old is what she said but that's what they told her when she got him you know you always got to hesitate when going by those numbers because I in the bird world unfortunately when a bird gets passed around and passed around and passed around people start making up ages and that's just the truth so you really don't know what you're dealing with until you actually see them you got to look at their talons to see how calloused the talons are believe it or not it's like a tree trunk like the, the thicker it is um, the, the older they are Sometimes the thickness can be because of their situation, whether they were a wild caught bird and they were out for longer periods of time in the wild. You know, being in the wild, obviously flying from tree to tree is gonna create some callus, but in our world, in the United States, um, a lot of these birds are domesticated and are hatched and raised inside a home. So their talons don't get to callus that much. So, but you know, that's on a case by case basis. You obviously don't just look at the talons, you look at a lot more. You look at the beak, how long it is, you, um, the, the beak formation. You look at the sears to see if they're calloused or if they're thick. You look at the eye ring, um, you look at the feather condition. There's so many things to look at to, uh, to figure out how old the bird is. But anyway, so I got sidetracked. So. Um, his name is Gabriel. He is a boy between 14 and 16 years old. And Gabriel um, apparently is like a super, super stubborn, super lazy macaw. Now, that is pretty weird. Um, having a macaw is like having a toddler. 
even when they get older, they have their mood swings, they have their energy. Um, from what she told me, he is extremely lazy. Like he doesn't even want to fly. She doesn't even think he knows how to fly because that's how extremely lazy and dormant he is. She actually, now I know this is going to be a topic of debate for a lot of people, but let's, you know, focus on, you know, the rescue and me and the relinquishment first before we make our opinions. Um, but she does leave him outside. Um, she does take or she does take him outside, but she's telling me how dormant and how unenergetic he is, how lazy he is. She takes him outside on his tree. He loves his tree perch and he's unclipped, he's flighted, um, but he does not fly away. He doesn't even attempt to get off of his cage or get off of his tree. Now she did say that she did try to um she actually did try to get him to fly and she did what everyone does Continue when they want to see their bird fly. She had him on her arm and she threw him up into the air um, to see if he would fly. It was in her house and she said that he, he was thrown up into the air and she was horrified because he actually crash landed on the ground. I'm so sorry guys. Hold on. I need to make sure I'm going the right way like an old person here. I got that old garment. Um, and he crash landed on the floor and she was horrified. Um, I've seen this happen before. I have seen it happen before. Now there, I didn't get a chance to tell her, but there are two reasons why he could have crash landed. Um, one of the reasons that comes to mind is because he, there is a great possibility being 14, 16 years old that he had an injury when he was younger and if, if he survived the injury, because unfortunately birds are so sensitive that a lot of times they don't survive their injuries and that's the, you know, the honest truth, the unfortunate truth. But if you survived his injury, let's just say he had a break in his wing or something like that and it healed wrong, then he could have learned not to use his wings or certain body parts, um, or certain body parts um, because they just don't function like that anymore. And he learned that. Um, the other thing that comes to mind that I have seen this before is that he was hatched and raised um, in the United States, domesticated parrots um, in someone's house or a breeder facility. Unfortunately, in the United States, the hatching and raising of a parrot does happen at a hobby breeder's house. Um, and due to a rookie mistake, um, that person was raising a macaw and they clipped his wings before he learned how to fly. Now I have seen that in different species of parrots. Um, when you clip a bird's wings before they learn how to fly, you actually take away their natural instinct of learning how to fly. And then what's going to happen when you take away that natural instinct, they don't learn how to fly, they don't know how to flutter, they don't know how to do anything. They are actually 100% codependent on a human. Now, why would a breeder do that? The breeder does that because yes, it tames down the bird a lot more because they have to trust you, but it is not necessarily healthy for you to do that. And let me tell you why in my next clip, Hold on. I literally have like three minutes to record myself each time and that's why these clips are, are like stopping and starting. But um, so anyway, we we're talking about the clipping of the bird. Now, making the parent codependent on you is, yes, it will definitely make the parent a more tame bird. But that's because the, the parent relies on the human 100% of the time to do everything. Now, is that necessarily best practice? No, it's not. And let me tell you why. Because, let's just be honest here, I'm going to say about 80% of pet owners, especially in the United States, the United States is a huge working community. Um, and 85% of these pet owners, maybe more, maybe less, but it's a lot, um, they work. They work uh, 7 to 10 hours or even more a day. And 
they are not there for a parrot to be codependent on them. We all know as parrot owners that parrots are super needy anyway. They're more needy than a bird. They're more needy than a cat. They're, I, I would safely say they're probably one of the neediest pets every, um, hands down. They're one of the neediest pets. So then you make them codependent, they're going to be psychotically needy. Um, so what happens is that when you clip, you take their instincts away, they're codependent on you. Let me make sure I'm going the right way. They're codependent on you. Um, what's going to happen is when you're not there to provide your service that they need because they need you to go to the top of the cage or they need you to climb around the cage or they need you for self-entertainment because they don't know how to move around or, you know, they... Um, need you for anything because take once you start stripping away the instincts while you're in the weaning process of that parrot You take away more and in, more instincts than just that one instinct Oh, but that's just a you know, I really that's a topic. I really love to talk about um, Especially because I train birds for to be emotional support animals So you really have to get into the psyche of the bird to really do that for someone um but no, and so then what happens when a bird is stressed and a, you're not meeting the bird's needs? We all know that as bird owners, uh, the birds start getting stressed. They start getting depressed. They start having emotional issues. They start picking their body. You really, I, I, and you know, everyone has their own opinion. And anyone can disagree with me, but with my experience, you really need to be careful taking away the bird instinct while you're in the weaning process of that bird. If not, you can cause a lifetime worth of problems and stress and that bird will be passed around and passed around because no one wants him. So I know we got off track a bit talking about the clipping of the bird, but one last comment on that is the only time I would ever consider clipping a bird um, before they learn how to fly. It's in really extreme rare circumstances Again, my customers know um, I have lots of emotional support parent customers. Um, I create a codependency. Yes, I do. Um, but mine is in, in a controlled environment and in a controlled purchase. Um, the codependency that I purposely create, I control it. I watch it. I document the hours that I spent creating that training, that codependency is when I do an emotional support animal and it's when I know the customer can't really be there for that parent and um, supply that codependency relationship that that parent needs. Because let's, let's all be honest, when we're dealing with emotional support animals, that's what it is, a codependency between the animal and the customer or their person. But anyway, so I digress. That's again, another conversation for another day. Um, but, um, so we're talking about Gabriel. So Gabriel doesn't fly. So that's what it tells me is that Gabriel probably was clipped or he was injured just as I explained before. And, um, I can't wait to meet him. So she says that he's a total man bird, but she says that, um, when she puts her arm up, when he knows he's actually going to go on his tree perch, just the way I said right now, when he, when she puts her arm up, so, and he knows he's going to go on a tree perch, he will actually step up on her arm. And that's probably because he doesn't know how to fly. You see how he uses her to move around. And if, if the parent doesn't have someone to do that for them, then he's going to get super stressed. And unfortunately, she's not there all day. She says she had to move him to her shop. Um, the, he doesn't get along with the husband. I think he honks a bit. So the husband's getting a little frustrated with that. And she had to take him to her shop. What type of shop she has, I don't know. I think it's like, she keeps on saying shop. I'm assuming like a car shop or something. Um, he was there to greet customers. But ever since he bit, I think her son, um, he bit her son for something. Um, and now, you know, they're worried for liability reasons. And that's totally understandable. You don't want a bird biting random customers and then getting sued. Who wants that, right? That would suck. But, um, <laughs> um, so here I am driving. I think, uh, I have about, uh, another hour to go. Um, and I'm going to make a video once I get Gabriel and I'm going to show you a few tricks and tips about meeting a new bird, especially a big one.
All right, so I picked up Gabriel and I wanted to limit the recording of the home for privacy reasons. She did show me Gabriel's setup. Gabriel was in a pole barn, a very nice pole barn, had to have been nice at least 1,500 square feet. Clothes. He was not in a shabby area at all. He was very well taken care of. He had a macaw cage. He had a play stand. She did show me how Gabriel would go to the top of his macaw cage and he would not come down. He would not step up for her. Very stubborn. Um, he did not like being bossed around. Now, he was not aggressive, but he did not like being bossed around. She had to get him on a perch to get him on his play stand, and she said that was really the only way he would ever come off of his cage. Now, on the play stand, he was constantly shaking, um, and he wouldn't stop shaking, and she said that that was normal for him that ever since he went to her home he just was constantly shaking the only time he ever stopped shaking was with he was with her son and that is why she thought he was a man bird but if you remember an earlier conversation I always hesitate in saying that it's a man bird or a woman bird because sometimes it's just the situation so here we are back in Texas. I, I brought Gabriel back to Texas where his feathers are just going to get amazing. And um, I'm going to start showing you what I did to acclimate Gabriel and to see whether he really, in fact, was a man or a woman bird or to assess his body language and see what he's about. And as always, I hope you enjoy our videos. And if you like and subscribe, you can support us in making more videos and um, educating our wonderful customers and the public on owning a you feathered friend. You want to tell everyone your name is George? You want to tell everyone your name is George? Say hello. Say you're the biggest, fattest blue and gold ever. Ever. Yeah, you are. We're gonna go to Texas. We're gonna go to Texas. You always wanna start off slow when it comes with to parrots. Um, always, always assess body language. Um, George, George is a little bit nervous, I can tell, but the way his feathers are actually placed nicely on his body and I when I say placed nicely I mean they're not fluffed up um, they're not flat on his head or back it means that he's pretty comfortable um, parrots actually do show worried eye and that's what I call it but they do show worry in their eyes when they are very stressed and uncertain about a situation and um, it actually looks very much like a human uh, uncertainty and um, George's eyes, George's face does not show that. George just actually looks pretty excited that I, I have his door open. Um, as you can see, <laughs> he looks more like he's excited to come out and to, to meet me. Do you like that? Do you like that? Mom. Okay, here we have Gabriel. We, we brought him into one of the extra bedrooms here. And you know what? I think I called him George in the last video. I've been so exhausted. I don't think his name is George. I believe his name is Gabriel. But now, guys, getting the name of the parrot is um, very important as a parent knows when you say his name wrong believe it or not i promise you that they do so this whole road trip i probably was calling him george and he's probably like who the heck is george here's my beautiful daughter bella we're getting ready to go to the beach here's vin and lily and who is hiding behind me and gabriel so um, I picked this room. You always want to pick a room. You know, I actually have a lot going on here because we're moving. But believe it or not, this is one of my most empty rooms. You always want to pick a room that has less danger, um, less potential for danger in it. Um, obviously, if you have fans, don't have the fans turning on full speed. Um, make sure that there's nothing he can really crash into. Um, and I would even close that door so that if for any reason he flies, he doesn't fly out. 
Um, and then, you know, I have my three kids here. Don't tease him. You always want to tell your kids not to stick their fingers in the cages because it's their instinct that they want to. Um, and then it actually makes the bird nervous. So we don't want to make the bird nervous before we let him out. Now, I've already assessed Gabriel in my own way, so I, I pretty much trust him. And he already looks like he's ready to come out. So everyone stand back. If there's people in the room, just nicely ask the people to stand back because we don't want the parrot to be nervous now gabriel i was told is 13 to 16 years old which means that he already knows what a human is now if he was a baby who maybe was mistreated or a baby who was traumatized i would say that that's where you probably want less people in the room because the baby really doesn't know humans yet but he he knows humans he's pretty comfortable and he looks like he's ready to come out so I was asked a question on Facebook. Do I let him come out or do I bring him out? It honestly is just the personality of the bird. So just like humans, you know, when you ask about a human, should I force the human out or should I just let him come out? What's your answer going to be? You're going to say, I don't know. You know, tell me about the human and then I'll let you know. So the same thing with, um, same thing with uh, Gabriel is I've already sort of assessed him. He looks pretty calm. He looks pretty eager to come out. He's already at the door. So when they're already at the door like this, you pretty much just let him out. So now I'm going to let him out and I'm going to let him come to me. Now, the first step is, is you always, if you're going to have a parrot step up, especially a bigger parrot, you always want them to step up when they're on the ground and you're up high because that sets you up as alpha and they're um, omega and they are more submissive to you. So we're going to let Gabriel out. Hi, sweet. Now I'm going to go above him. <laughs> So that he doesn't feel he's superior to me. Step up. Now he did not want to step up right away. He wants to go on top of the crate. I'm going to position myself higher. And I'm going to show you why. Because if I position myself lower. I'm here kneeling on the ground right here. And I'm in my bathing suit too. I apologize. But if I kneel myself lower. I want you to look at Gabriel's body language. So I'm sort of like almost laying on the ground and I'm going to put my hand up and I'm going to say, hi. Hi, Gabriel. Step up. Step up. Step up. So I'm telling Gabriel to step up. He's sort of a little, um, he looks like he's not moving. I have been told that he's a little stubborn. And I, 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 my kids are laughing because I do look funny. I'm here on the floor, but I really want you to see how, how he, I know, how he's reacting when I'm below him. So it is a natural parrot instinct to feel that they are superior. They love to be in a superior position to the human because it makes them feel safe. So when you're below, they actually become more stubborn. So I'm going to slide over here. He can still see me below him. He's probably thinking this weird lady. No, step, step up. up. Step on. And he's putting his forehead to me. That means he does not want to step up. He just wants me to touch him. So naturally, when you're above them, they will be more submissive. because they don't feel as safe anymore. Now we're not saying that this is a, uh, a fear or a danger. This just means that he doesn't have the upper hand anymore. Now I'm above him. Now it doesn't mean all the time that he's going to step up just because I'm above him. It just means that I've taken away his power. Now let's see what he does uh, when I tell him to step up. Step up. Now, right there is telling you that he does not want to step up. Obviously, he's walking away. He seems a little nervous. You always want to say step up firm because everyone has different accents. Did he poop? Yes. He, everyone has different accents. Everyone says step up differently, but you really want him to get the message step up. Step up. 
Now he put his beak out. That means he really doesn't want to step up. He's probably nervous. I have my children here. There's a lot going on. So we want to establish the trust. Now we can't always um we we can't always pet a parrot right away. Um I just assessed his body language while we were driving in the car and some of my friends might have seen my personal Facebook posts and he um I pretty much knew I could I could probably trust him and he trusted me from the beginning even though I was told he was a man bird. Um, so this is why I'm petting him, but this, you cannot always right away pet a parrot. Um, you always want to be careful with that. It can be dangerous. They can break bones if they want to, but assessing whether you can pet a parrot will be a video for another day. But Gabriel and I obviously have established a little bit of trust already because he's going to sleep. <sighs> Are you going to sleep? But we've already established that he would not like me to have him step up right now. Now, another thing that could be making Gabriel nervous is I have a phone in his face. Now, that actually does make a lot of pets nervous. I know my Australian Shepherd gets nervous when I have a phone in her face. So it could be another reason why he's not stepping up. I also have Vincent right here. And he's, it seems Gabriel's looking at Vincent, unsure. So, I've dealt with macaws before. Um, that's the way Gabriel came at me right now is actually just a reaction. Um, and really, it's just one of those risks that you take with a parrot. Again, I've assessed his body language. I've assessed whether his feathers are flat to his body or ruffled, which could tell me his hesitancy. I've assessed his eyes. I've assessed what he does when I put my hand up. Um, so I, you know, for me, I know that Gabriel is not, he's not, um, he's not in attack mode. He is not aggressive at all because if he was aggressive, he would be going at my phone right now and he's not because the phone's pretty, oh, well, <laughs> he's going to prove me wrong. Are you going to prove me wrong? Ah! <laughs> but um as you can see he's actually pretty lovable he barely put any pressure on my phone he is not an aggressive bird at all so um so that's the reason why i didn't take my hand away all the way when he came at my finger i know that was just more of a reaction and um, he's not going to put that much pressure. But again, you know, these videos can go on and on and on on the body language because just as humans are very unique in all personalities, so are parrots. But there's so much you can learn and, you know, every, there, there's no um, ending. There, there's not an ending to how much you can learn about animals and parrots and body language and psyche. But you can eventually know enough to do a quick ass assessment on an animal and a parrot to know whether um, right away uh, what you can possibly do and what you can't. And again, it's always a risk, guys. It's always a risk because, you know, any parrot trainer, any animal trainer will tell you sometimes you assess and sometimes you assess wrong. So just being in the animal world in general is just a risk in itself. Um, but yeah, so, but he is actually a good bird and I'll make more videos and tell you how he's doing and, um, and uh, how he's uh, d developing and uh, unraveling his personality with us. But let me tell you, this has only been, what, 24 hours with me and this is him at his most nervous so right there it tells me that he is a really good bird at heart step up so i just showed you the best move to have a bird step up i had gabriel come off of his crate right here and I put him on the floor, as you just saw, and I had him step up on my arm. Now, 
I can tell you almost any bird, even aggressive parrots, will step up when they are on the ground and they have a human go to them. You just have to be careful because the parrot can bite you when they are on your arm. But 90% of the time, even the most aggressive parrot will step up on your arm when they are completely on the ground. When they are completely on the ground, they are pretty much 99% vulnerable to the elements and it makes them afraid. And your arm being approachable is the first thing that they can go to for safety. So don't think it's that they like you. Don't think it's that maybe you've created a friend. They are going to the first safety net that they see being on the ground. But that is a awesome training tactic because when you hold them on your arm and they're safe and then nothing's chaotic around them, then they actually start building that trust with you. So that's just my tip for the day. Um, but there's so much more that goes with that. I obviously have kids in the background that could be making Gabriel nervous. So, you know, I have a controlled environment, guys. I allow my kids to do those silly things around the animals and such. But that's because I know I've assessed animals so much. If I really thought Gabriel was a threat, I would tell him to get out. But in a normal situation, when you don't have a lot of parrot experience, I will tell you, don't have the sillies in the background, mm -hmm. even though it's really cute to look at. <laughs> and there you go. Gabriel is really... Um, he's really, uh, feeling, uh, he's really feeling, um, calm on my arm. Sorry, I lost my track there. I'm trying to think of my words. He's really feeling calm on my arm. He's already preening himself. And that is the start of Gabriel and I building our trust together. Now I'm going to, um, for a beginner person who this is their first time dealing with the rescue and their adult bird, I would say do this for a couple minutes and then put them back in their crate and then do it a few times a day to start building that trust. Lost again, going back around Dreaming of a time when I get things right Lost in the shadows of a